Well, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome our speaker today. Uh, he's an old friend of the Faraday Institute. Uh, he's done a project with us on artificial intelligence uh, and given some memorable talks in the past. Uh, professor John Wyatt is Emerita Professor of Neonatal Pediatrics, Ethics and Perinatology at University College London. Uh, so he has great experience of dealing with uh, difficult situations uh, that not infrequently involve dying. And that's what he's going to be talking about today, about dying well. So let me, without further ado, hand over to John. And thank you very much for joining us, John. We look forward to your presentation tonight. Thanks so much indeed, Bob. It's a real privilege to be here and to take part in this exciting uh, venture. And um, it, it's uh, a, a new episode, I think, in, uh, in Faraday, as it is for so many uh, organizations. Uh, and um, it's amazing to me how well the technology works, you know, and, and I think that uh, the challenge is to uh, use this uh, in, in its global reach. So I'm going to be talking uh, on the topic of dying well, we, we've been looking at the, the, the overall theme of human identity. And uh, of course, death is one of those ultimate realities about what it means to be human. And normally the topic of death is one that um, is a taboo subject. It's one that really in polite company, you don't talk about it. In many ways, death has become the ultimate taboo. But in this current age of the uh, pandemic, it's uh, rather different, isn't it? Because we're confronted with the reality of death. Um, here we see a mass grave uh, in New York and uh, a body being carried out. And we, we, we've all been uh, hit by the reality of death and dying um, in, in a, an extraordinary way. And so this is a really important topic for us. It's important at any time, but it's particularly important at a time when people are thinking about what it means to die, what the risks of death are, and, and, and there's a great deal of fear. And we've seen photographs like this of the inside of a, an I, ITU, intensive therapy unit, um, with um, uh, bodies on ITU receiving maximal life support and the, uh, the staff in these kind of uh, suits. And of course, it's a place where relatives and other people have been banned and therefore it's entirely uh, a healthcare and medical environment. And uh, the extraordinary tragedy of this uh, current epidemic is that for many, many human beings in the UK and across the world, this is the last human contact they will have before their death. Uh, they will uh, be confronted, uh, admitted to hospital as an emergency and confronted with a health professional with this full protective gear when it's almost impossible to see the person themselves. And they may well then be admitted to the uh, intensive care unit and put into a medical coma. And that, sadly, the um, uh, certainly in the UK and in most developed countries, the, uh, the mortality rates following admission to intensive care has been as high as 50% in many cases. And we have these images of, of, uh, of health professionals battling against, against death and against this terrible disease. And uh, it's the medicalization of death and dying, which is very striking. This is the words of uh, theologian Alan Verhey, who said, the body of the dying person has become the battlefield where heroic doctors and nurses wage their ceaseless war against death. And not surprisingly, there's a, a real growth of anxiety. And um, this is just an example taken from Psychology Today uh, magazine, where a psychologist talking about how reminders of illness and death uh, in the coronavirus epidemic reawaken long suppressed and, and deep existential fears. And the writer starts by saying the ultimate tragedy of the human condition is our awareness of our inevitable mortality. And I, I, I think it's the fear of death which has been uh, exacerbated and accelerated and ac accentuated by the, the coronavirus pandemic. And of course, governments have, have uh, actually intentionally tried to raise the fears of our mortality in order to encourage us to uh, obey the lockdown, 
uh, to save our own lives, to save the lives of others. Um, and so the fear of death is a very real phenomenon. And it's interesting, of course, if we look in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, um, the author is saying that since children have flesh and blood, he, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So the fear of death actually is an extraordinarily powerful and, and potentially damaging kind of slavery. And I suspect that one of the long lasting impacts of the coronavirus will be that it has raised some of these deep, deep fears. And it's interesting to see how the fear of death then works its way out, particularly in the world of science and technology. And one of the interesting things is that the idea that we're going to overcome death by the use of sophisticated technology is now a very current idea um, where people are saying, as we understand aging as an illness, we understand what the mechanisms are, uh, then increasingly we're going to find a technological fix. We're going to find a solution uh, to repair damage that occurs at a cellular level during the aging process. And ultimately that means we'll be able to extend life. And um, there are, uh, this is the SCNS Research Foundation working to develop, promote and ensure widespread access to technologies that will prevent diseases and disabilities of aging by comprehensively repairing the damage done to our bodies over time. Uh, so th this is becoming a major technological um, focus uh, to try to uh, overcome death using technological means. And uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about Silicon Valley and the rise of the tech giants is it's become apparent that there's a whole group of very rich and very scared tech entrepreneurs who are just terrified of death. And as they've used technology to solve every other problem in their lives, it's obvious to them that uh, using technology to tackle aging, but ultimately death, which is the re end result of aging, uh, that is the, their goal. And so Calico is a startup with uh, millions and millions of dollars have been pumped into this. It's actually uh, at least part owned by Alphabet, the owners of Google. And um, there are many other examples in Silicon Valley of this kind of technological approach. Perhaps the, the weirdest and, and it's almost tragic comic is uh, the so-called Cryonics Institute, where in order to overcome death, the idea is that you can have your body frozen in liquid nitrogen. Uh, in the rather forlorn hope that centuries to come, uh, someone's going to thaw you out of your liquid nitrogen and use 23rd century technology in order to restore you to life. And um, people are spending good money. These are cryo, uh, cryogenic uh, containers filled with liquid nitrogen and also filled with bodies uh, that are uh, stored uh, in, in the hope that they're eventually going to be resurrected uh, by technology. So that's the sort of extreme end. How else do people respond to death? Well, I think a, a very common move which we're seeing, which is growing, is what's sometimes called the natural death movement or the positive death movement. And uh, there's been a growth of death cafes and um, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growing thing. And behind this idea is the idea that death is just natural. Death is part of nature. We're born, we flourish, we get old, we die. This, it's the cycle of nature. And really, wisdom is to accept that death is a, is a natural. In fact, it's a good thing. If you didn't die, we'd overpopulate the planet. And so it's a kind of of seeing death as something positive, as something natural, something not to be afraid of. And uh, for example, a quote like this, for a man who has done his natural duty, death is as natural as sleep. There's nothing to worry about. It's just part of nature. So that's one response as to seeing death as nature. And another response which we're seeing is, is the idea that actually I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to use medical technology to choose when I die and to end my life 
by technological means. And our newspapers have had a constant stream of, of tragic stories of individuals who've decided that their lives were pointless or were terrified of what the future held and they decided to end their lives. And um, in this case, uh, Jeff Spector, who is the gentleman on the right in the white shirt, uh, he was a self-made businessman. He uh, was doing very well. He was in his 50s. And then he was diagnosed with an incurable cancer, which was pressing on his spinal column. And the uh, doctors told him that really there was nothing that could be done because of its, it was so close to the spinal cord that what would happen is this tumor would slowly grow. And as it grew, it, he would become increasingly disabled and ultimately he'd be in a wheelchair and he might be incontinent and so on. And Jeff Spector said, not me, I refuse that to happen. And he said, suicide is my least worst option. And so he called his family and friends together and they had a celebration meal. And here's the photograph of them having the celebration meal. And actually at the meal, he told them that he was planning to travel to the suicide clinic, the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland. And um, they remonstrated with him, but he was absolutely adamant. And that's what happened the following day. Apparently he traveled to the Dignitas Clinic and was killed with a lethal injection. And the general, uh, you know, the newspaper coverage of cases like this are often to say, well, you know, what a noble uh, thing he did. You know, he didn't want to be a burden to other people. He, he didn't want to become disabled and to depend on care. He wanted to go out like a man. And, you know, why on earth did he have to travel to Switzerland? Why couldn't the NHS provide this service? Uh, I mean, to many people, it seems absolutely outrageous that we cannot control the time and the manner of our dying. You know, we can control everything else about our lives. So why on earth is this one thing uh, that we can't control? And there are campaigns around the world. This is uh, a society which used to be called the Voluntary Euthanasia Society. Uh, but uh, over a decade ago, it went over, it had a complete remake, uh, change of image, uh, change of title, and it's very significant. They, they chose the title Dignity in Dying. And if you read their website, uh, you don't find uh, any reference to killing or to euthanasia or to suicide. It's all about choice, control, a dignified death for all, patient choice at the end of life. But actually, the, the sole purpose of this organization is to campaign for a change in the law for the legalization both of medically assisted suicide, but also of medical killing of direct uh, killing by, by injection. And as we know, there are a number of jurisdictions around the world where uh, medical killing is now enshrined and, and part of, uh, in fact, standard medical practice. In, in the Netherlands, which was the first uh, uh, country to actually legalize medical killing, euthanasia, um, euthanasia is now seen as, as, as a pretty routine and normal thing, particularly in cancer. Um, but in other conditions as well. And the numbers are steadily increasing. Um, and there are various um, different statistics around as to what percentage of all deaths are medically assisted. Some people have calculated that if you take all the forms of so-called medically assisted deaths, it may be as high as 15% or even 20% of all deaths in the Netherlands. And now the, the big debates that are going on in the Netherlands is not about death from cancer, but is about death, for instance, from psychiatric disorders um, or about, uh, for instance, people with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there has been, although the numbers are small, there's been a progressively rise of numbers of people with Alzheimer's disease who have been killed by euthanasia in the Netherlands. And uh, it's interesting that Alzheimer's disease in many ways has become something that modern people is, is the ultimate fear. Uh, I know we had a, a fascinating and, and very thoughtful presentation about the care of people with Alzheimer's disease just earlier today. Um, but for many people, Alzheimer's disease is the ultimate horror as they look into their own future. And it's interesting that for many people, including for many Christian believers and other religious believers, Alzheimer's disease has become the most frightening uh, 
prospect more than cancer or some other uh, terminal conditions. And of course, the statistics suggest that uh, because Alzheimer's is basically an age-related disorder, as the uh, number of aging people in our population increases, uh, then the number of people with Alzheimer's disease is likely to increase, unless there is some dramatic break, medical breakthrough and a new treatment that can actually reverse the disease, then it seems likely that there's going to be a, a significant rise. These are figures just projected in the UK, 800,000 in 2012, a million in 2021, 1.7 million in 2051. And people say, well, how are we going to cope as a society with this kind of problem? And, and there are a significant number of people who say, actually, some kind of euthanasia, some kind of medical killing is probably the solution. Most people don't say those kind of things in public, but Dame Mary Warnock, very eminent medical ethicist and philosopher in the UK, uh, she actually said these words, if you're demented, you're wasting people's lives, your family's lives, and you're wasting the resources of the National Health Service. I'm absolutely fully in agreement with the argument that if pain is insufferable, then someone should be given help to die, by which she's talking about euthanasia. But I feel there's a wider argument that if somebody absolutely desperately wants to die because they're a burden to their family or to the state, then I think they too should be allowed to die, by which she means, actually, it was clear in the context, that they should be killed by a doctor at their request. And one of the very troubling cases that's happened in um, the Netherlands just last year was a, a case of a, 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 an elderly person who developed Alzheimer's disease. And before she developed Alzheimer's disease, she had repeatedly said to her doctor and to her relatives, if I ever develop Alzheimer's disease, I want you to kill me. I don't want to, I'm absolutely clear, I don't want to live in that state. And she'd repeat, said, repeatedly said that and assigned something. But as she developed uh, the disease and as it got worse, um, the, then there was the, the question, the relatives were put, putting pressure on the doctor saying, this is what she wanted. Uh, she, will you now um, do what she asked and give her a lethal injection? Um, but when she was approached and asked if she wanted to die, she actually didn't, it seemed, that she'd changed, that actually she was quite uh, happy. Or at least her, her mood was changing from time to time. Sometimes she seemed distressed and frightened. At other times, she seemed quite happy. And so there was a lot of discussion and debate but eventually the doctor agreed to that he would give her a lethal injection. And then because she seemed to be resisting, she was actually given a sedative. Um, and then when she continued to resist, she was actually held down and then received the lethal injection. And this case was reported, it caused a lot of distress. It went to the Supreme Court in Holland, but the Supreme Court basically supported the uh, doctor and said that it was clear that this was her previous wish and that we should therefore respect her previous wish to be killed, whatever her feelings were in this case. So it just shows you some of the extraordinary ethical and difficult personal questions which um, this kind of medical killing is, is raising. And it's not, not just in uh, Netherlands, it's in other countries, including in Canada, where there is current debate about these uh, kind of cases where there's what's called an advance decision, an advance request for medical euthanasia. And there's an interesting, just as a side issue, there's an interesting um, philosophical and even theological debate about, um, in, in the case of someone with Alzheimer's disease, it's sometimes been described as a then self and the now self. So the then self is the self who was cognitively intact, who, where the brain was working normally and, and the wish, they expressed their wishes very clearly. But And the now self is the person who has Alzheimer's disease and who... Uh, and, and what do you do when there seems to be a conflict in the beliefs and wishes and goals of the then self and the now self? And uh, some people say, well, it's absolutely it's the then self that matters. It's what the person is while they're cognitively normal, that their wishes should always take precedence. Whereas others would argue, well, why aren't the wishes of the person now with Alzheimer's disease? It's perfectly possible for ch people to change their mind. And um, maybe the person who has Alzheimer's disease now doesn't have the same desire to end their life. And so you can see these extraordinary complexities, which 
the prospect of medical killing has, is raising. In, in the Netherlands, um, the eligibility for euthanasia has gradually extended. It's now extended to children with terminal diseases, even under the age of 12, provided the parents agree. And um, in the idea that actually you can have euthanasia and at the same time you can donate your organs is also an idea which is now gaining currency. Uh, it was particularly Belgium that is one of the places that has pioneered this. But interestingly, this is now because euthanasia is now legalized in Canada, um, it, it appears to be a growing phenomenon that people are saying, I want to kill myself, but I also want to donate my organs. And that means that instead of uh, being killed at, in, at my home, in my bedroom, I'm actually admitted to hospital and prepared my so that I can be prepared to become an organ donor. And in what's being suggested is that ultimately people will be admitted to the operating theatre, um, they'll be anaesthetised, and then basically all their organs, including heart, lungs, liver, will be removed, and, and they will die simply as a result of the donation of the organs. I'm sorry, this is all very grisly, but this is actually uh, being proposed, and already organ donation, euthanasia, is, is part of the practice. And I just looked up these statistics. In the first 11 months of 2019, euthanasia patients in Ontario accounted for 18 organ uh, tissue donors, a 14% increase and 109% increase um, over previously. And euthanasia related donations accounted for 5% of overall donations in Ontario share that's also been increased. And a law has now been passed by the regional government that, at, that everybody considering euthanasia must by law be approached by the regional organ donation body in advance so they're given the option of donating their organs. And uh, Ronnie Gavsey said, as part of high quality end of life care, we make sure that all patients and families are provided with the information they need and the opportunity to make a decision about whether they wish to make a donation. That just follows the logical protocol under the law and the humane approach, humane approach for those who are undergoing medical assistance in dying, which is what euthanasia is called in, in, um, in Canada. And it's the right thing to do for those on the wait list. So is this a good way to die? Is, is medical killing with organ donation or at the time of my choice, is that the best way to die? And these are important issues which none of us can escape. I haven't time to go into the arguments in, in detail about euthanasia, but I am convinced that actually intentional medical killing uh, which is both euthanasia and assisted suicide, is not a positive way to die, both on medical and ethical grounds, as well as from a Christian perspective. And if you want to take that further, then I've written a book specifically on this topic called Right to Die. But I think all of us, are, the related question is, what does it mean to die well? And, um, you know, if you ask people how they want to die, most people say, well, actually, the way I want to die is I just want to die in my bed. I don't want to have any warning. I just want to go out like a light. No premonition, no warning. Yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? Just bang, just go and not know nothing about it. It's very interesting that if you were to go back, say, three or 400 years, and you were to ask people how they wish to die, it was generally agreed that sudden unexpected death like that was the worst possible way to die, to be catapulted into eternity with no possibility of saying goodbye to your loved ones, no possibility of asking for forgiveness for the things you've done wrong, no possibility of passing on your life last words or making provision for your loved ones, uh, no possibility of preparing yourself to meet your maker and your judge. Um, and so people used to be terrified of sudden death. And it's very interesting how what used to be seen as the worst possible way to die is now seen as the best way to die. And I think that says something about our kind of narcissistic culture, I'm afraid. But in, the reality is very few people die like that. Most people die in hospital. And many, many people die in one of these ways, either on the left with failed cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or as we've heard, many, many people in an ITU um, with tubes coming out of every orifice and surrounded by impersonal health professionals. And there is evidence that um, uh, Christian people or religious people 
um, actually, in a, in a survey done in the States, they had an increased preference for heroic medical treatment at the end of life, lower rates of do not resuscitate orders, and increased use of intensive life prolonging care. So it isn't just an issue that affects people who have no faith. It, um, these are really important issues which everybody needs to think of. And I like this quote from a, a, um, a funeral director in the States who said, the most common Bible verse that families have read at funeral announcements or read at services is I have fought the good fight, which comes from 2 Timothy, the New Testament, except they're not talking about spiritual things. What they mean is that this person tried every medical option to stay alive. So that desperate attempt to survive, why is that still this idea that death is a terrible enemy and, and we fight to, to, to stay alive? I, I've been very interested as I've been reflecting on these things and, and trying to write about it. I've been very interested in the medieval tradition which was happening uh, before the Reformation in Europe when sudden death was very, very common with plagues and with warfare and, and, and so on. And um, there were these circulating documents called the Ars Moriendi, which is, means the, the art of dying. And they weren't intended for priests and for religious professionals. They were intended for lay people. And in fact, um, someone said that the best modern equivalent would be dying for dummies, which I thought was a great title. And I was tempted to use that title in my book, but discovered it was copyright. But um, I decided to try and write a book called Dying Well, which is really a 21st century version of the Ars Moriendi. And in these documents, the person who was dying is, is given... Uh, is taken through a series of um, uh, instructions and advice about how to prepare for death and how in particular to uh, think about the temptations that dying could bring, the temptation of doubt, the temptation of despair, of impatience, which sounds rather strange, but which is basically, I think, petulance. Uh, the temptation of pride and particularly spiritual pride was something that the medieval period worried a great deal about and the temptation of greed, the virtue of letting go. And I think those temptations are still very real today, but there are probably two additional temptations for us moderns. And one is the denial of death, that some people just don't want to go there and pretend that death doesn't exist. And, and, the, and the final temptation is the temptation of self-reliance. And so again, there are the virtues, the virtue of acceptance, accepting that death is a reality for all of us and discovering that dependence is actually not necessarily an evil or negative thing. And so I think one of the important things as, as we think about what it means to die well, and, and one of the things that people, modern people often say, I'm terrified about being dependent, to become dependent like a baby, to have to be washed, to have my bottom wiped, to be fed is disgusting, it's horrible, it's subhuman. It's evil and I don't want to go there. I prefer to kill myself or to be killed rather than to end up in this dependent way. And I think what we've got to learn is that actually vulnerability and dependence are, are part of the narrative of what it means to be human. This is where we come back to our human identity. We all of us come into this world utterly and totally dependent on the love and care of others. If, if you hadn't been loved when you were born, if someone hadn't fed you and washed you and kept you warm and wiped your bottom, you wouldn't be here. And so we all of us are utterly dependent when we're born. Then we go through this phase when we care for others, people, and but most of us are going to end our lives dependent on the love and care of others. And that isn't a terrible evil thing. Actually, it's part of the narrative of every human life. And therefore, we have things to learn. We have more to learn at the end of life. We have more to learn about dependence and about vulnerability because our goal is to be, uh, become more human and dependence is, is part of our humanity. So as we think about death from, and particularly now I'm thinking from a Christian perspective, there's a very interesting complexity or nuance about a Christian understanding about death. So Christianity can never say, oh, death, it's just natural. That's the problem with the natural death movement is it doesn't engage with the wrongness of death. 
that, that death is an enemy. And the, the, that so death and life are not equal. Uh, God is a God of life and death is the negation of life. And so death is an enemy which we must fight against. In my own work as a clinician, working as a pediatrician, caring for little babies, uh, I can remember hours and hours spent uh, fighting to keep death away from a tiny little frame in an intensive care unit. And sometimes spending all night just there, adjusting the settings of the machinery, watching, monitoring, fighting against death. Because de was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it because death is an enemy to be, to be fought against. But in Christian thinking, it is possible for death to change from being an enemy to becoming what C.S. Lewis called a severe mercy and even a strange kind of healing, a gateway to a new reality. Because what the Christian hope teaches us is that death, physical, biological death, is not the end. Uh, there is life beyond death and there is the hope and the promise of resurrection, not of some disembodied um, existence in a kind of spiritual sense, but actually what Christian faith teaches is a, a physical resurrection um, in, a, in, a new, uh, with, in a new creation with new bodies. And so the art of medicine is that on the one hand, we must discern when we fight against death as an enemy, but at the same time, trying to discern the point when death changes from being an enemy to resistance, resisted into a gateway to a new existence. At that point, the right thing is to say enough is enough. And I think one of the problems is often that, that either the doctors or, the, or, or we as patients or as relatives, we're not prepared. We don't have the courage to say actually enough is enough. It's I don't want to fight against death. I'm prepared to move on to the next stage of my human journey. And so we have to constantly balance the benefits and the burdens that treatment uh, can bring. And again, I haven't time to unpack this in detail, but this is a very fundamental question. Every medical treatment has potential benefits, but it also has burdens and risks. And the whole art is to make sure that we only give treatments that's doing more good than harm. Because the truth is to die in an intensive care unit with tubes coming out of every orifice is not a good way to die. And I'm afraid thousands and thousands of people in the UK and in the US and in Italy and elsewhere have died in that way, uh, where actually the burdens of treatment were far worse than the benefits that it could bring. So in Christian thinking, the evils of old age are real evils of fatigue and disease and memory loss and so on. But old age itself is not an evil. It's part of the human narrative, a stage on the journey to be honored respected and even welcomed. And so then as I'm coming to the end, I just want to briefly talk about palliative care. Then in, in palliative care of the dying person, this is a, a wonderful initiative which actually started here in the UK and it started with a Christian physician, uh, Cicely Saunders, who invented a whole new way of caring for dying people and which has now gone around the world. And in palliative care, the aim is neither to accelerate the dying process nor it's to impede it, to slow it down. The, the goal of palliative care is to allow death to occur by natural processes, whilst we focus as the carers on maximizing the quality of those last final weeks, days and hours, that the, the lived experience should be something that can be very precious. Here is Cicely Saunders, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. Not only will we help you to die well, we'll help you to live before you die. And those words, to live before you die, became the slogan of um, the whole palliative care movement. Um, another of her, her great aphorisms, you don't have to kill the patient in order to kill the pain. And so she uh, she became a, a specialist in pain management. She discovered new ways of using pain relieving medication, the best kind of approaches. You don't have to kill the patient in order to kill the pain. And so as we look at um, the dying process, uh, it's quite helpful to see these stages, how uh, over, uh, we, 
you start if you've got a, a terminal condition such as cancer or some other degenerative conditions there's a sort of progress that goes with months then to weeks then to days and then those final last hours and trying to work out where someone is on this progression is is very important as we decide what is the best care for people one of the terrifying and tragic things about the coronavirus infection is that this process is accelerated uh, dramatically so that it's possible for someone to go from being really quite healthy uh, literally over a few days to being accelerated into the dying process and what that teaches us therefore is that we have to have the conversations now about what it means to die well that it's not good enough to wait in the hope that uh, before the end, I'm going to have to be able to talk to my loved ones about how I wish to die. And so there is a great move here in the UK and in many developed countries in what is now called advanced care planning uh, and discussing with people at the end of life how they would wish to die, helping them to make choices, to plan, to look ahead, to discuss with relatives and so on. And there are a number of uh, legal routes, uh, lasting power of attorney, where you give legal authority to someone else to, um, to make decisions on your behalf if you become incapacitated. You can write advanced refusals of treatment. But something that I think is particularly helpful is a written statement of values and wishes, um, which you can write in advance and tell the healthcare team what's important to you. What are the things, if you were dying, that would be really important? Who would you want to be there? What would you want to be done for you? And so on. And so, and so if we are, have someone who is with a terminal condition, what are the kind of questions we could ask them in order to have this conversation? I think a very good question to start with is, is, what do you understand about what's going on? Just getting people to talk about their own situation. Uh, sometimes you're surprised that people actually don't realize how close they are to death. Then the second question is you look to the future. What are you most worried about? What are your greatest concerns and worries? Get people to talk about their fears. And it's interesting, for some people, the greatest fears are medical overtreatment and of excessive burdensome intervention. For others, the greatest fear is actually the opposite. It's of, it's of being abandoned by the doctors and being just allowed to die from neglect and dehydration. So trying to identify what people are worried about and frightened about is really important. One of Cicely Saunders' great insights was the idea of total pain, that pain was much, at the end of life, was much more than just physical pain. Yes, there was physical pain, and physical pain can be very well treated with power, powerful painkillers, opioids, and other medication. But then there's psychological pain, there's anxiety and distress and depression and other psychological problems. There's relational pain, whether they've been damaged and distorted and destroyed relations, maybe with close relatives and so on. And then there's spiritual or existential pain. And what Cicely Saunders said is you have to deal with each four aspects of pain. It's not good enough just to give medication. Uh, you've actually got to address. So for psychological pain, it's talking therapy, or it might just be friendship. Or, uh, for relational pain, it's actually trying to restore and, and uh, relationships that are broken to get relatives and so on. And for spiritual pain, it, it's it um, can be counselling, it can be worship, uh, being part of a worshipping community, um, speaking to a pastor or a, a chaplain or just a, a close friend. Suffering is not a question which demands an answer. It's not a problem which demands solution. It's a mystery which demands a presence. And uh, so we can't make it, we can't sanitise dying well, but we can be there. And, and speaking, you know, as a doctor and as somebody who's witnessed many people dying over the years, it's one of the greatest privileges we can have is just to, to walk that journey together and to promise that I'm going to be with you and stay, stay with you to the very end. And then as you look to the future, what are your goals for this stage of life? What, what are your dreams? What, how, how can we, what can we help to make happen? And Amazingly, dying well is an opportunity. It's a time for focusing on the things which really matter. It's a time for saying sorry, for being reconciled where there are broken relationships, a time for receiving afresh the grace of God, a time for fulfilling dreams, a time for relinquishing tasks that's not going to be completed, a time for learning new lessons, 
time for passing on to my loved ones the deepest concerns of my heart, time for encouraging those who remain, a time for preparing in faith, hope and love to meet my creator. And it's fascinating that actually in the New Testament, the death of Christian believers is very rarely described as death. It's described as falling asleep. In fact, in this verse in 1 Thessalonians, it specifically says that Jesus died so that the Christians don't need to die, they fall asleep. And again, I haven't time to unpack that in any detail, but there is something very profound in this uh, concept because the thing about the person who falls asleep is that they are still there, they're safe. Uh, and you know that the person who is sleeping, you only have to touch them and instantly the person is back. And the reason therefore that the New Testament writers emphasize the fact that Christians fall asleep is, the, is to emphasize the fact that they were safe. The person was not lost and therefore we would meet again uh, at the resurrection. So I close with this, one of my favorite verses in the whole of the Bible, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter until the full light of day. You know, in the secular world, life starts from nothing. You start as a tiny little cell. It grows, it grows, it grows. You know, you're a child. Eventually you reach adulthood and then you've really reached your peak and then you hit 25. And from 25 onwards, you're on the long, slow decline, bit by bit, DNA damage is accumulating. And you, to begin with, the damage can't be seen, but gradually it gets worse and worse. And then your hair starts falling out and you get wrinkles and your muscles wasting away and, and your brain's rotting and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And eventually you die and that's it. But in Christian thinking, life is like the first gleam of dawn it's like we've been going through the night and then the night goes on forever. But then you see out on the horizon, you see this first gleam of dawn and you know, moment by moment, uh, second by second, inexorably, the day is coming. And uh, I uh, found this photograph on the internet of two climbers in Alaska. They climbed through the night up a peak, clinging to the rock and then at, on the summit, they waited for the dawn to come and they took this photograph. And that encapsulates the way that we're called to live. Yes, we're in the darkness, but we're called to live with our eyes on that first blush of the coming day. Thanks very much. Uh, it's been good to share with you. Well, thank you very much, John, for a very thought provoking uh, talk. Um, there's, there's plenty of opportunity now for questions and quite a few have come in already. Uh, so let me start you off with, with a couple that people have talked about. I wonder if you could say something about whether the fear of death is universal among all different cultures and so on. Um, and I wonder from your own experience, uh, have you talked to people who are you know, getting close to death and what are the main reasons why they're frightened of it? Uh, do you have any insights into that? Yes, thanks. Good questions. Um, I think the fear of death is almost universal. And in fact, someone who had no fear of death, genuinely no fear of death, one would worry about their mental health or their cognitive abilities, because mm. I, I think it is deeply rooted in our, on our humanity. Um, of course, it, there are all kinds of other factors, um, there are big cultural differences. Uh, so I think we in the West, in this modern technological environment, it's a very death denying kind of culture, which is part of why there's such a taboo. We just don't talk about it. But I think the fact we don't talk about it in a way feeds these deep fears. And it's much better to talk about fears. It's much better to, uh, to have these conversations with our loved ones. Um, so what, what are those fears about? Well, again, I think it's a very, very individual thing. Um, a lot of people have said to me, you know, it's not really death I'm frightened about, it's the process of dying. And I think that is a very common uh, fear. Some of it is, is fed by the fact that very few of us have actually watched somebody die. It's part of the problem with the medicalization. It used to be that 
that people died at home. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of people would die at home. And because mortality was very high, in every family, people would have watched people die. They would probably have watched children die. They would have watched elderly people die. It was just part of life. Now what happens is that death has been sanitized and pushed away behind curtains in, in the hospital. So most people have never watched somebody die, have no idea of what the process might be. And of course, in that sense, terrible fears and horrors um, accumulate. And, and so uh, often people, and it's often fed by horror movies, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I think, um, it's unfamiliarity, which it makes things worse. I think some people are just terrified of pain and uh, of, of overwhelming agony that they just would be completely um, uh, uncontrollable. And of course, that's very sad because the reality is that with proper medical care in the West, thank God, uh, there's no reason why anybody should suffer that kind of uncontrollable physical pain. You do, sadly, still hear terrible stories of people crying out in agony. But the interesting thing is that when people are crying out in agony, despite having received lots of pain relief and so on, then you can guarantee that that is not physical pain. That is some other kind of pain. That's spiritual pain or relational pain or or psychological pain. And of course, what's important is to deal with the pain, understand why there is this deep internal agony. Mm. Thank you. I wonder if you can say something about, um, there's a question here, about seeing death as an enemy. Uh, And you pointed out that C.S. Lewis saw it as a severe mercy. Uh, And we heard a lecture a couple of days ago from Dr. Walton about human beings being created mortal in the beginning. Um, So there have been Christians through the ages. I I mean, I think of Bishop Cyprian in Carthage. who, who urged in a famous sermon, urged Christians to stay behind and treat people who are in a massive plague that went right across the Roman Empire. Uh, because look, what have you got to lose? You've got um, new creation waiting for you if you die and you know you should be caring for other people. Luther in Wittenberg said much the same thing during plagues there. Uh, Paul himself, the apostle Paul said, I can't decide whether it's better to die, or, uh, go and be with my Lord or, or to stay with you. Uh, so I'd be interested in your reflections on that. Um, how should we see death? Yes. So I think the, I, the whole uh, development of modern medical care comes directly out of the Christian vision. I mean, it's not an accident. This is something which has been airbrushed out of medical history by and large. Mm. But the truth is that... Um, the first hospital, modern hospital, was actually set up by a Christian bishop in order to care for victims of plague. Um, So the whole initiative for physical caring um, comes out of um, the Christian uh, understanding that physical health matters and that Jesus has come to bring life. And of course, that's demonstrated in the healing miracles of Jesus, that he both uh, was concerned about people's spiritual issues of guilt and forgiveness, but he was also concerned about their physical well-being. And so I I think that fundamental commitment of Christians to life and and they opposed uh, killing, they opposed intentional killing. Uh, That's why they joined up with the pagan uh, sect, which was set, started up by Hippocrates, and there was this interesting uh, amalgam of the the Christian attitudes, which came from Christ, and the pagan attitudes, which came from Hippocrates. Both of which said that intentional killing was wrong. But on the other hand, um, as you say, Christians saw that actually sac- sacrificing my life for someone else might well be part of my Christian calling, and and so being being uh, working in healthcare, actually, until the modern era, working in healthcare was always a dangerous occupation. You, you, pretend, you were obviously exposing yourself to risk every time you went to care for sick people. And many, many Christian uh, physicians have given their life and nurses and healthcare professionals uh, over the centuries because they saw there was something even more important than protecting their own, their own health. So, so I think, 
Christianity sees life as a fundamental good, but it, but it's not the supreme good. There's there is a time to risk my own life for the good of others, and and it, and it's been true today. Many you know we know that there are health professionals in the UK and around the world who have given their lives because they were caring for people with coronavirus. Mm. Thank you. Uh, another question, perhaps you can amplify this, you touched on it already in your talk, is um, we're, we're called, as you've just said, by uh, to honour life. That's one of uh, a Christian perspective. Um, I wonder if you could speak about a little bit about um, intensive palliative care versus euthanasia. When does it slip from one to the other? Um, you, as I say, you have talked about this a bit, but perhaps you could just draw out the distinction between those two. Yeah, thanks. It's it's an important question. And part of the rhetoric of those who want to promote euthanasia, and, and there's a whole sort of campaign group so trying to promote euthanasia, it, what they say is actually doctors are killing people every day every in the hospital. Uh, they just do it in a more subtle way so they don't get caught out. What we're wanting to do is just regularise it all so that in, you know there's a proper law to control. I mean, that's the rhetoric, but it's completely false. Um, the, the reality is that there's a complete difference between palliative care where the intention is not to kill. It's all about intention. The question we always need to ask ourselves is what am I trying to do here? That's something, you know, when I teach medical ethics to doctors and medical students, I, I often say that you need to sit back and say, what are we trying to do here? And when we are caring for somebody who's dying, our intention is not to kill. Uh, and therefore, we actually choose drugs which are safe. The drugs that palliative care doctors use, none of them are, are drugs which have a very high risk of causing death. If they did, palliative care doctors wouldn't do it. We're not trying to kill our patients. We're trying to care for them <laughs> and stop the symptoms. That's completely different. The drugs that the euthanasia doctors use are completely different. They, they use massive doses of barbiturates um, precisely because they are extremely dangerous. They cause death. Um, so th so that th there is a fundamental difference between palliative care, which allows death to occur, where, where we're neither aiming to accelerate death nor to prevent it or stop it, versus euthanasia where the intention is to kill i suppose you you've partly answered this question already um somebody asked what do you say to a patient who is in such a painful condition in tears and says they just want to die i i presume your answer could be look there are ways of dealing with this pain is that correct absolutely so the so the next thing to say is is to try to unpick why where is this pain coming from is it is it a psychological problem uh, is, is there actually depression here, which, which is treatable? Is it a relational problem? Is it a spiritual problem? Actually, you know, the spiritual pain is very common. Uh, people are tor tormented sometimes by guilt uh, or by fear of, of what's going to happen after I die, um, a sort of existential futility. And, and so I think gentle, loving, careful unpicking of what is at the root of the of this quotes pain, and then and finding a, a positive approach. In rare cases where distress is actually overwhelming, what palliative care doctors sometimes do is they literally they use a drug to put someone to sleep for 24 hours safely, and then they wake them up. And sometimes you find just having that period when someone is incredibly distressed, then you wake them up. Then now it's possible to start to unpick and work out what, where the distress is coming from. So there are lots and lots of positive ways of, of dealing with this kind of distress. Mm, thank you. Uh, there's a comment from another uh, doctor uh, who I know is a Christian because I know them, <laughs> but I won't say their name. Um, As a doctor, I've seen many people die, uh, this person says. I'm frequently surprised that those who I would expect to be looking forward to being in the presence of Jesus seem to seek the most medical treatment to avoid death, which is exactly what you said in your talk, isn't it? Uh, their comment is, I find myself wondering if they really do believe there's an afterlife uh, with Jesus. Do you think that's a fair comment? 
um, to think that. Well, it's, I mean, it's it's very complicated, isn't it? You know, I, I mentioned a research study that was done in the States. And one of the interesting things in, in the paper, the researchers said they asked, because the, their researchers were surprised that these all these religious people were actually insisting on having heroic treatment. And they said there was sort of two overriding reasons, they thought. One was the group of people who said, well, you've got to have every possible treatment because if you don't, that's, that's like euthanasia and that's wrong. Uh, so uh, just a kind of misunderstanding about, um, you know, about medical treatment and so on. But the second was very interesting. And that was, well, I'm having faith and trusting God that he's going to do a miracle and he's going to heal me. But I've got to give God the best chance to heal me, because if I don't agree to be admitted to the intensive care unit, then I'm not having faith in believing he's going to heal me. So, so you do get all kinds of complicated um, rationalizations going on. But I do think there is a problem also with um, the kind of teaching we often get in churches, which which puts a great deal of emphasis in many churches on sin and forgiveness and so on, but actually very little this emphasis about resurrection, about the new heaven, about the new earth and what, what we can learn about it and what's promised and, and so on. And, and which seems to me such an essential part of, of the Christian understanding of, of, uh, of the story. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're coming near our end. I'll, I'll just ask one quick question and then, then I'd like to ask something more personal if I could. Um, this is a question about whether, do you, do you, have you seen any statistics concerning the mental health of the physicians who perform physician assisted suicide? I mean, is it a problem for them, a high prevalence of guilt and mental distress in the physicians? Have, is there any study been done on that? Yes, there, in fact, there have been a number of studies, particularly in the Netherlands, and, and perhaps it's not surprising that there's actually quite a high incidence of mental health issues amongst uh, physicians who've carried out um, euthanasia. It seems to be quite common for physicians to have flashbacks, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, some depression, increased incidence of depression and so on. Um, so, I mean, it's not surprising really because it's so much like an execution. I mean, just, you know, we heard that horrific story of, the, of this elderly woman with Alzheimer's disease being held down while the doctor is mm. giving her a lethal injection. And you can imagine the kind of distress that this, this causes. I think the slightly alarming thing when you talk to euthanasia doctors is they say, well, the first one is always the most difficult. Mm. But, you know, once, once you've done 10 or 20, they become much easier. And, and I'm afraid that that is also the way that there's a kind of hardening that can happen once people are doing these these kind of of acts mm. which are morally deeply problematic mm. well thank you john i wonder if i could uh, if you don't mind if i can ask you a personal question as we as we finish because we should stop in a couple of minutes uh, but take all the time you like um you've quoted the bible a lot and you have a christian faith uh but you've also dealt with some um very trying conditions, fighting all night for the life of a, a tiny baby, as you mentioned, um, and, and presumably counselling parents and trying to explain to them why their baby has died. I wondered if you can say something about how your faith impacted your professional work or vice versa, how your professional work impacted your faith. Yeah, thanks, Bob. It's... Um... I have been a Christian believer ever since I was a student, and um, in fact, my Christian faith was part of the motivation for going into medicine. I actually switched from studying physics to, um, to studying medicine, partly because of I just felt a very strong internal sense of call. Um, but I have to say that, you know, I have been through some very challenging experiences and dark experiences. And, and um, I it's certainly not the case that having a Christian faith gives a kind of, you know, lovely, fluffy um, explanation and, and hope for, um, I, I think there have been times of darkness and, the, and even despair at times in, in my career. But what I have seen time and time again is this just amazing sense that uh, even the hospital bed, even the intensive care unit uh, 
uh, can be touched by something remarkable. Um, that the presence of God is not just in church, is not just in religious um, places, but, but sometimes there is just uh, this overwhelming sense that God is here, not, not explaining the suffering, not, not making it go away, but somehow walking with us. And that's the wonderful thing, I think, about the God who is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ is not a God who just says, oh, yes, you know, they live and they die, these pathetic little human beings. It's a God who enters into our suffering, who walks along with us, a God who weeps with us. And uh, he doesn't explain it, but he participates in it. And, and in a small way, I think those of us in the caring professions are called to be to participate with him to, in the fellowship, what's called, Paul calls it the fellowship of suffering. It's a deep mystery and yet a most wonderful one. Well, thank you so much, John, for sharing that uh, personal insight with us. Uh, it's a great uh, encouragement to the rest of us uh, as we um, live in what's a broken world, isn't it? But it's a wonderful world at the same time. It is. If we were all with you, we'd all give you a huge round of applause. And I know there's a lot of appreciation for it. Uh, it's one of the strange things of these online things that you just disappear at the end. But uh, we're, we're thinking about what you said and there's a great deal of uh, gratitude for, for your talk tonight. So thank you very much, John, uh, for doing that. Um, well, thanks so much. And thank you to everybody for, for spending the time with me this evening. Yeah. Thank you, John.